So hi folks, uh, today is the um, the uh, first uh, monthly meeting of uh, for EFCO for uh, 2022. And uh, so we've got a quite a few things to cover today. Um, so we are going to start by uh, doing the AGM. That should be a relatively short period of time. So what we're going to do there is we're going to review the financial reports, which are very, very simple. And uh, then we'll proceed to board elections. So there's a number of people who uh, are, um, uh, their term is ending and we have two uh, positions that are open. So uh, we're hoping to elect two replacements uh, for that position, those positions. Uh, once you've done that, so hopefully that shouldn't take more than um, 30 minutes max. Uh, we'll get into the regular meeting. So uh, like usual, we'll have the EV news. Lots of interesting things have happened over the last uh, little while. So lots of stuff to, to uh, report there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And also uh, we, um, nope, I'm trying to get something. There we go. Whoops. <laughs> that is not what I wanted to do. Uh, okay, so uh, lots of EV news to cover, and Mike will cover that for us. And then after that, we'll uh, we'll talk about fighting climate change. So uh, this is a bit different from what we usually do. We usually talk more about EVs and related technology, but uh, what Mike will do is he'll take us through some of the steps we could take to uh, decarbonize our own our own uh, houses, our own uh, lives. So uh, that uh, that should be quite interesting. I saw the slides and the uh, there. They are quite interesting. After that, uh, Craig is going to talk to us about EVs in the cold. Uh, you probably saw some headlines and memes on uh, Facebook when uh, I-95 uh, was uh, shut down for a while there in the U.S. near Washington. Uh, so he wants to talk about that and, uh, and the reality uh, surrounding that. Uh, then we're going to talk about past and future events like we usually do, uh, but we'll focus on uh, this thing that we're doing with Envira Center. So, um, so very excited about that, uh, we're, and looking forward to um, to, to uh, you know participating in in all sorts of activities this year, all sorts of events where uh, we'll be able to. Um, reach out to a lot more people than what we have in the past. So we'll uh, we'll get to that when we get there. Then we um, during the roundtable, there are two things that I would like to cover. One of them is uh, we're looking for a name for the project with Enviro Center. And uh, so we're going to ask you guys if you have any creative uh, suggestions. And Marcel, I think seeing that you just drank some wine or something there, you may have more creative suggestion than others, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll take any suggestions you have. <laughs> the more creative, the better. We want a catchy name that's going to um, uh, to be easy to remember and um, uh, that we're going to be able to use to uh, to do our uh, marketing and, and all that. OK, and uh, also um, I haven't seen all oh, Mitchell's uh, there. So uh, Mitchell, uh, uh, I'm. So Mitchell reached out to me because they're looking, the city is looking for suggestions for where uh, EV chargers should be located. And um, uh, the city is having some trouble getting some some good recommendations. So what we'd like to do is uh, go over, uh, well, I should give you a link to where you could go and put some input on the overall transportation master plan. And in particular, uh, the portion where uh, you could give your feedback on, on EV chargers. So um, it's important for us to try to select locations where the EV chargers will be used uh, yeah. as extensively as possible. So uh, so the city is looking for some feedback on that. and. Uh, we'll get a chance to provide that, okay? Uh, one of the things we've done on our uh, website that uh, with uh, PayPal actually is we now have a link. If people want to donate uh, money to EFCO, we'll be accepting donations. Uh, we may not accept um, crazy high donations if, if, if someone decides to... Um, uh, to provide money that would uh, be seen as as um, undue influence, we may refuse it. But <clears throat> if anybody is is uh, willing to provide us some extra funding, you'll see once we get to the um, uh, to the project with uh, Enviro Center that uh, we have some really good plans uh, going forward, and uh, we're hoping to be able to raise a bit more money to be able to uh, make those plans uh, go as, as smoothly as possible. So there's a Bitly address there. If go slash or da dash donate uh, if you're uh, willing to do that uh, but uh, it's uh, definitely optional okay so we wanted to give uh, members a way to provide more than their 23 dollars a year membership fee if they so desired okay okay so uh, mike 
Uh, would you like to uh, yeah, start sure. the news, please? Do the news. Uh, but first, uh, Phil's hand Alan is up. Phil, did you have something to say? Um, yes. Thank you. Question. Sorry. Go ahead, Phil. You first, then. Okay. So there's some background noise. So I think there's someone, one or two people's mics who are not muted. Could you maybe address that, please? That's, that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Oh, thanks, Phil. Yeah, can somebody mute whoever's unmuted right now? Stephen Bailey, I think. Uh, okay, he's muted now. Excellent. Great. Okay, all that right. That's a problem, thank you. Great. Okay, so um, starting with the news Put, for January. Just, there was a question that I wanted to address just quickly. Someone asked about if, if the donations are charitable. As someone has looked into this for other organizations, uh, they are not charitable. And in order for us to become a, quote, charitable organization, the cost would be prohibitive. And it's it's not uh, it's not something that is any time in our foreseeable future going to happen, unfortunately. Yeah, so we are a nonprofit, a registered nonprofit, but not a charitable organization. So yep. we cannot issue uh, tax receipts. Yeah, and, but one and thing you, you won't be able one to thing do you could do. Soon. One thing you could do is you could actually uh, join a uh, charity that exists, okay, and get them to create a fund for the uh, association, and the fund would go to them, okay, in your name. So when you organize an event, uh, they would organize the event. And they would pay Evco to actually do this. Um, I used to work for the. I used to be on the treasury board, the the board of the director for the Fondation Franco-Ontarienne, and we did this too with 54 different organizations out there, uh, which are francophone organization. But uh, it is possible that you organize this with a foundation to manage this on your behalf. Okay, so so and if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to talk to you uh, about that offline to see how we would sure. be able to do that. Okay, Call thank me you. Anytime. Call me anytime. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, Mike, back to the news. <laughs> back to the news. All right. Um, so it's a, there's a lot of news this month, so I'm going to run through it fairly quickly. Uh, all the links are provided on the slides themselves, which we do post on our website. So if you're curious about something. Uh, you can go to the presentation after the meeting and uh, follow the links. Uh, so the first item up is uh, Hyundai is abandoning gas engine development and fuel cells, uh, which is kind of remarkable given that uh, they just had their fuel cell event in November touting their third generation uh, fuel cell stack and everything. But it uh, turns out that come December, uh, they've they had an internal audit which decided that the uh, third gen fuel cell system was not meeting expectations uh, it was it was too expensive it wasn't as efficient as they were hoping for and so they're basically scrapping both um, the gas engines and the fuel cell stuff uh, they've reassigned 12,000 employees from the uh, from the the gas engine development division over to electric vehicles now they still do have engineers working on existing gas engines and they're going to keep those alive uh, for the life the remaining product life of the products that use them but they won't be developing new ones and this is according to a couple of korean uh, news outlets uh, next slide please raymond there we go all right uh, so if you like me have been waiting for the all-electric id bus the uh, the new volkswagen hippie bus uh, there are now leaked images on the internet. Uh, I was spotted earlier this month by a few people, uh, some people in Norway, including Bjorn, if anybody follows YouTube. Um, Volkswagen has said that the launch for the vehicle will be March 9th. Uh, they're currently doing a bunch of road testing, and these are production-ready prototypes, it sounds like. Uh, there are images of the insides of the van online, um, and it looks very interesting. Um, so if you are interested in that, I'm sure you can Google the images. Um, they were leaked, and I put leaked in quotation marks because uh, some people uh, think that the leaks are more of a hype thing than an actual leak, uh, which I 
suspect is probably the case. Volkswagen is trying to build a bit of momentum uh, for their reveal on the 9th. Uh, there's no pricing or availability yet, but uh, they are coming. Next slide, please. All right, GM is increasing its investment in electrification yet again. Uh, they're doing a $7 billion investment, which is the largest investment in a single thing that the company has ever done in its entire history. Uh, six and a half billion is going towards the Orion assembly plant and the Ultium cell in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, Ultium cells is the factory that will be building all of the power plants, like all the, the batteries and whatnot. And then the Orion assembly building will be converted from fossils to electric drive. Uh, there's some other investments um, that add up to about a half billion dollars, which <laughs> only a half billion dollars, but you know, big, big money. Uh, they expect to create about 4,000 jobs. Uh, they're retaining 1,000 jobs. Uh, most of that money is going to Michigan. Uh, their planned capacity for just three years from now will be a million units. They're hoping to reach that. Tesla, by the way, has just hit that. Um, and they expect to launch 20 new EVs next year. Uh, so they sh they've got a lot of work to do and they should get cracking. Next slide, please. Uh, Kia announced EV6 pricing for the U.S. market, but curiously did not release pricing for Canada. Uh, the car is going to be available spring 2022, so literally in the next few weeks, uh, this car will be landing in Canada for delivery. Uh, but if you want one, it's too late. They are already sold out for the entire year, and they are not taking pre-orders for 2023 yet. So if you were interested in the EV6 and were waiting to drop that pre-order, you have missed the boat. Um, they start at $40,000 US, 33 after the rebate there. Um, they go up to 55. On our EV buyer's guide, I have converted these values into Canadian dollars to give you a bit of an idea. Although I suspect the prices will be a bit lower than what we expect because of the ISEV mandate or rebate, yeah. I should say. Um, that has yeah. a downward pressure on prices. And so the actual pricing for the EV6 in Canada should start at probably under 45 Canadian. So I've got a source that tells me that they're very um, anxious to make sure that they uh, qualify for they qualify. Yeah, I suspected so. That's why the, so the EV6 light rear wheel drive you'll see there listed at 40, that has a short range battery and it's rear wheel drive and it's a stripped down version. So. I, Dollars to donuts, that'll be the $44,999 version. And then everything goes up from there. And you can expect the top trim to top out at around 60000 just like the um, Ionic 5 has done. So if you see Ionic 5 pricing, I expect, although it's not confirmed, that the EV6 pricing should match pretty much what Ionic 5 has done. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the BMW i3 is being put out to pasture after nine years. Uh, BMW made a quarter million units. It was the first iCar and it's ceasing production in July. Uh, its sibling car, the i8, already ended production last year in June after only 20,000 units, but that was kind of like a supercar kind of thing. So it was always gonna be low volume. Uh, the car that's replacing the i3 isn't gonna be a direct replacement as in it's not the same style of vehicle. Um, it'll be the iX1 and the Mini Cooper. There's a next-gen Mini Cooper coming, and they expect both of those vehicles together to sort of fill the niche that the i3 currently occupies. Uh, so if you want an i3, now's the time to get it because they stopped making them in July. Next slide, please. Nissan is um, redoing the Micra. It's the Micra, if, if anybody's unaware of the Micra, it's a very uh, inexpensive small car. Um, people have them. I know that I know people that have them and they love them. Uh, so Nissan is revamping the Micra. It's going to be an all electric vehicle. They're not going to do a gas version. Uh, it's going to be built by Renault in France at, <laughs> I like the name here, Electricity Center. That's a very clever naming scheme there for that factory. But anyway, um, it's going to kick off a uh, Renault Nissan Mitsubishi Alliance 2030 roadmap. They've got a big roadmap for EVs. They're going to spend 23 billion euros on it. Um, it's going to be on a new platform, uh, so not it, it won't be a bespoke platform it'll, or a conversion from an ICE vehicle. It'll be a brand new platform, uh, much like all the other automakers are doing. 
And they expect to launch 35 new EVs before 2030. So in the next seven years or eight years, they'll be launching 35 new all-electric vehicles. So that's promising. Hopefully Nissan survives long enough to see the fruits of this plan. All right, so now it's time for Tesla Corner. There is a lot of Tesla news. If you haven't been following the EV world, um, they just had their Q4 announcement for 2021. Uh, last week, I listened to it live. Uh, so we'll get into it. Uh, Tesla is not working on a $25,000 car, according to Musk. So ignore the internet rumors. There is no cheap Tesla coming. Uh, te Elon Musk actually said during the call, he doesn't feel the need to make a cheap car because once they have their autonomous cars, um, you won't need a cheap car because it'll just be, you'll just use it like an Uber kind of thing. So you won't actually have to buy it. I'm not sure how that's going to work out. Um, somebody obviously has to own the car in order for it to be made available for ride sharing, but whatever. Uh, so don't expect a $25,000 Tesla anytime soon. Um, in fact, he actually said there's too much on their plate right now as it is. And you'll see what I mean in an another couple of slides here. So next slide, please. Yeah. So, so um, I just a little comment. Yeah. Uh, he was he was very careful in his wording. He didn't say they hadn't developed it. No, that's true. He said, but he's, he's, we're not, not working on it right now. They're not working yeah. on it right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was very clear it's not coming anytime soon. So don't hold your breath. Yeah. Um, there's a recall out if you have a Tesla Model Three or Model Y. Uh, there's some issues with the heat pump and actually even the uh, non-heat pump versions have issues with heat too. Uh, so Transport Canada and NISTA are looking into it. Tesla's rolled out a few over the updates, which may or may not fix it. Uh, there are reports that those who have received the update still haven't had it repaired. So uh, just keep an eye out for that if you own a Tesla. Yeah, there, there's some people like me who haven't had any problems. I don't think Darren's yeah. had any problem either, right? Uh, but there are many, many reports. Many of problems. Yeah, um, uh, exactly. My car doesn't I, I have a heat pump and it, the heat Florida works pretty and... well. What was that? I, I was, was just seeing my car. Sorry. Died. My heat died in Pittsburgh. And um, I had to do, a, no, I just did the reset and it worked fine after that. And I took it to the uh, Tesla in Florida and they didn't seem to find anything wrong with it. So, and it's worked great ever since. Yeah, apparently it has to do with an air flap at the bottom, an air intake that gets uh, stuck open or closed or something. Uh, so there's a mechanical component to it, but they feel like they can fix it with software updates. So uh, just keep an eye out and uh, hope for the best if you have a Model S or 3. Sorry, a Model Y or 3. All right. Um, batteries are not the production bottleneck. I think this might be the first time ever for Tesla where production is not constrained by battery availability, which is fantastic. Um, Nobody actually knows. Tesla hasn't announced what their current capacity for production of batteries is at the moment, but they did confirm on the earnings call that batteries are not the limiting factor for deliveries. Um, if they, he even said that if they could, they would deliver you know 200, 300 percent more cars than they are, um, but that they're being limited currently by a bunch of other stuff, including chips, but more than just the chips. Uh, first cars delivered from Giga Texas will be Model Ys, and they will come before the end of Q1, so in the next couple months. Uh, they are going to have 4680s in them as a structural element, and they are currently producing those cars. And if you watch any of the drone footage on the internet, you'll see them starting to line up these brand new Model Ys outside Giga Texas, which is kind of cool to see. Um, and Tesla senior vice president of engineering confirmed that yes, they are producing model wise with the 4680s and all the, all the wise coming out of Giga Texas will have 4680 packs, which is cool. Cause my dad just ordered one and should arrive in March or April. Okay. Uh, so if you're waiting on your Tesla cyber truck, um, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to wait longer. Um, however, they have teased you with a sort of production ready prototype. Uh, so there were some leaked photos out of Giga Texas that actually might have been legitimate leaks by a construction workers, it looks like. Um, he confirmed, must confirm though at the call that they won't be delivering any of these trucks until 2023. Um, but the prototype is neat. It's um, It looks a lot smaller than I was expecting it. I think they might have had a, a reduction in size. Musk did talk about that on Twitter at one point last year. Um, it has a windshield wiper, which is obvious, and some new uh, mirrors, which is required by law. 
And uh, there's no door handles. Apparently, the Cybertruck will present its doors much like the Model X does currently. Um, and so they've eliminated door handles. Uh, so there you go. This is the new, na- new for now uh, Cybertruck and what it looks like. Um, but you'll have to wait for yours for another year at least. Next slide, please. All right, so as I had mentioned earlier, um, you'll see the pictures on the slide here. The top picture is Giga Texas. That building is enormous. Um, And on the bottom, uh, those are workers installing chairs for the car on the new battery pack. So the way that the structural pack works is they install a lot of the cabin stuff on it, and then they put the car on top, like they drop it down on top or whatever. Uh, So that's a really cool way of building a car, it looks like and kind of proof that they are using structural batteries at this point. Uh, They're currently, uh, before they can deliver, they're awaiting final certification. Um, So that's just some paperwork that I guess regulators have to fill out. And once they get that, they'll start delivering cars to customers. Um, So yeah, there you go. Model Ys are inbound. All right, so this, I don't know how I feel about this as a owner of one Tesla share, but whatever. Um, Musk is prioritizing Optimus Subprime, which is the robot, the Tesla bot that they announced uh, last year. They showed it off, and it was basically somebody in a suit dancing. So Musk is prioritizing this robot now um, to take a lot of their development resources. So it's going to be powered by Tesla AI. Uh, They hope to have a working prototype by the end of the year. And they want it to resolve the labor issues uh, in the U.S. So basically take over jobs from humans. Um, okay, sure. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're also because of this delaying delivery of Cybertruck Roadster and Semi. So there you go. I, I just like the image. It was a great image. Anyway, next and I think that's it for my new slide. So now, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So that was it for the news. I, I just wanted to make a little comment on that. I, yeah. I, I think I think this is one of uh, um, Elon's uh, Mall X uh, door thing, right? Where he's, yeah. Yeah, he's I'm distracting a little... himself and you should be yeah. focusing more on the core business and just getting, the, getting that ramped and – you know, maybe yeah. creating another company to do this uh, robot thing if uh, if he wants to do that. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. ostensibly he wants to use them in the gigafactories to do the jobs that are like super repetitive and kind of dangerous. So I mean, yeah, sure, okay. Um, yeah. But if it's delaying your core business, which is vehicles, then that's kind of a, an issue as far as I'm concerned as well. Yeah. yeah, I have a I have a hunch that he's doing that because he's not happy about having to have a union in uh, Germany. But uh, that's my uh, <laughs> yeah, impression. Yeah. You might be onto something there. All anyway, right. So yeah, yes. next next part of the presentation is is uh, Mike again with uh, talking about uh, climate change stuff. Mm-hmm. And I promise this will not become the Mike show this month. Uh, so <laughs> I just have two. That's it. All right. So um, what can you do to help our climate? I know climate change is a big deal. Um, and so we're going to talk about sort of stuff that you can do to help combat it. Uh, We're going to talk about the impacts of climate change. Um, Is there hope? What's the hope? Um, What can you do and how can you join the fight? Next slide, please. Okay, so yes. um, One of the issues when talking about climate change to basically anybody um, is the fact that it's this huge, big, hairy problem that's kind of scary and very depressing and it just feels like you can't do anything about it right so why even try is is a lot of is what a lot of people say um and you kind of get this helpless feeling like we're just sort of on this train into the abyss altogether and there's nothing we can do to stop it right um but i mean the reason we're in this mess is from individual actions at the end of the day, right? Everyone's guilty of burning fuel at some point in our lives. We've all driven gas cars. We've all, you know, worked in areas that burn stuff. Our houses all have furnaces that burn stuff, right? So the climate change problem was created by individuals, not 
giant organizations. I mean, yes, giant organizations are responsible for a ton of emissions, like the majority of them, yes. However, we each play a part, like everybody plays a role in creating the crisis, which means everyone can play a role in stopping the crisis or at least mitigating it. Um, it's human instinct when we're faced with a big challenge to sort of blame others and try and avoid having to change our ways and do stuff differently. Um, but it doesn't have to be this way. And if we, if we just think a little bit, um, there is a lot that we as individuals can do. And the more the people that realize that and start actually making those changes, the more of an impact happens, right? So um, here at Evco, we're all, or most of us have electric cars and we're you know spreading the word of EVs because we realize that it's a better technology uh, it doesn't kill the climate. And so this is like the first step. It's the entry drug, as I like to call it, um, for fighting climate change. And as a result, like our neighbors see our cars and people come up to us and ask questions. And and it, and the same can happen for the rest of the stuff in your life as well. So if you're looking for a bit of a checklist on what to do about climate change, then you've come to the right place. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. And uh, there is hope. Uh, we We don't have to rely on others to do something about it. Uh, there's stuff that we can do right now. We have the technology. Uh, we still have time. We, we don't have a lot of time, but we have time to, to do changes, to make changes. Um, we just have to start doing it right now and start acting with a bit of urgency and spreading the word that yes, there's stuff that we need to do and we can do it right now. Uh, so let's get on with it. All right, to the checklist. So. I've broken it down into, it's not an exhaustive list, of course, um, but there are three basic things um, that you can change in your lifestyle right now uh, to help. Um, the first is your car, of course. Uh, cars are a huge source of emissions. About a third of our national emissions come from transportation. Uh, so switching to an EV now means you stop buying gas now, um, which is good. And you're not only saving the gas that you're not burning, right, the actual fuel that you're not burning, but you're also saving all of the upstream emissions from that fuel that you're not burning, which means the trucks to transport the gas to the gas station and the refinery and all the rest of it, right? And the more people that do that, the less demand for fuel there is, the less pollution the whole supply chain for creating the fuel makes, right? Uh, small engines. So uh, these are probably the easiest things to change out in your life. If you have an old lawnmower uh, that's loud and smelly, swap it out for a battery electric one. If you have a chainsaw, snowblower, leaf blower, all of these things have electric options, battery electric options that are available right now at Home Depot. Um, and honestly, they're way better <laughs> than the gas ones. I, yeah, I still have to change out my snowblower and uh, it sucks. Okay, and your house. So this is the hard one, right? This is the one that's expensive, more expensive than a car even. Um, I'll get to questions at the end of this talk, Terry, um, but yeah, just hold your questions for the end. Um, there's a lot of upgrades you can do if you own your house. It's a lot easier, of course, because then you can make the changes without having to ask anybody or go through a condo board. Um, the first step I would say is to uh, start an energy audit and Enviro Center, one of our partners is doing energy audits and they'll give you basically a list of everything that's specific to your house that you can do to reduce emissions. Um, the, essentially what the idea is, is to stop burning stuff. So anything in your life that has combustion, get rid of it, change it out, get an electric option instead. Um, it takes time and it costs money. So if you start chipping it away at the problem now, uh, then you'll start the savings now and you'll start not burning stuff now, right? So that's the idea. All right, so I'll get into each one more specifically now. I said now a lot. But we'll go to the car. Uh, you want me to change the, the slide? Yes, please. Uh, okay, sorry. Just so, just a little comment before yeah. before we change the slide. So I was uh, and actually Art uh, Art was on the discussion uh, about this uh, last week uh, where where I was talking uh, or making some comments. Anyways, if you think about it um, and you look at Canada's emissions, about a third of our emissions are oil and gas production. Mm -hmm. And about uh, a bit less than a third is transportation, and a good portion is um, 
houses and, and buildings, right? Yeah. Uh, if you think about it, if you eliminate the emissions from uh, the car fleet and the truck and all the transportation mm -hmm. uh, system, you would also eliminate a good portion of the gases, uh, of the uh, greenhouse gases from the production sector, right? Because That's about right. Yep. somewhere about uh, around two thirds of what we produce in Canada is consumed here in Canada. Uh, so a good 20% of the national emissions uh, in Canada are uh, to produce oil that's consumed in Canada. So if we get rid of that, we will we'll even do better than just eliminating the emissions from the transportation sector directly. Exactly. It's it's the upstream emissions that you also eliminate, right? So when yep. you when you when you eliminate something in your life that burns fuel, you're actually punching above your weight because you're not just eliminating that one liter or whatever you're using, you're eliminating all of the emissions that went into creating that as well, right? Yep. So your small changes actually have an outsized impact, more than you would expect. Um, all right, so the car. So obviously we're EVCO. We we like our electric cars and we like to talk about our electric cars. Um, oh, it's a shame your little converting to your, your PowerPoint has squashed my little no pollution logo, but whatever, it's fine. Um, so if you replaced your fossil car with an EV, um, that's obviously a good thing. We as North Americans, and if you look at this Our World in Data image here on the right, uh, we are up there with, uh, I think that's Saudi Arabia, as far as the highest per capita emissions uh, from oil production and consumption. And that's thanks to the tar sands out west, um, but also our propensity to buy giant pickup trucks when we live in Orleans and Barhaven and Alta Vista. And yeah, I mean, you don't need a pickup truck to go to Costco, but whatever. Um, we are we are number one in, are. In, the, in the amount of fuel we use per no. kilometer driven. Okay? Yeah, and we're the Americans worse. are... Yeah, we're yeah, worse than the worse Americans, than... but they're not even that far behind us, right? And so, yeah, yeah so um, changing out your car immediately for an EV will absolutely save you money and pollution. Um, and the the one of the arguments we hear a lot at Evco is that uh, yeah, but you know, creating an EV creates emissions, more emissions even than building a gas car, and that's true. It's a marginal increase in emissions to build a new EV. However, those emissions are more than accounted for within the first two years of operation. So if you keep your car for more than two years, you are doing the climate a favor um, by switching it out today, right? Um, and yeah, as we said earlier, when you stop buying gas, you're not only saving the emissions from that fuel, but also the upstream stuff as well. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, small engines, right? So there's a lot of small engines around. Um, all summer, I'm sure everyone here is people mowing their lawns. I have a neighbor that uses a gas mower that uh, is so loud that we actually have to like stop talking in order to wait for him to finish um, because we can't hear ourselves talk, uh, which is annoying. And <laughs> we've actually thought about pitching it, all like pooling our money together and just buying him an electric mower uh, just so that we can actually be outside while he's mowing. Um, but anyway, lawnmowers, chainsaws, snowblowers, leaf blowers, you name it, there is a battery electric version of it out there available now at Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever your favorite uh, home improvement store is. Um, a lot of them, if you buy in the same family, so if you buy like an Ego or a Ryobi, um, you do kind of get locked into their family of batteries. So, you know, choose wisely, do your research. Um, but what's cool about that is that if you have a small amount of batteries, you can swap them between devices because you're not going to be like mowing your lawn and cutting down a tree simultaneously. So you can use the same battery for both. Um, it's an easy thing to do. It doesn't cost that much money. They are slightly more expensive than their gas equivalents, but the prices are coming down. And I was actually looking at new snow blowers uh, this winter because my gas mower is horrible and I hate it. And I want to get that exact uh, ego that's in the picture here. Um, and it turns out that, you know, it's 1200 bucks, but you know, a big dual stage gas mower is also 1200 bucks. So you know, they're, they're cost competitive now. Um, so it's something that you can do, especially if you have aging tools. Um, they're just as capable. They're even more powerful than the fossil tools. And unlike my, my snowblower, uh, they start every time. You don't have to worry about it. They just, just like your EV in the cold, they'll work. Next slide, please.
All right. So the house is the next big ticket item. And this is something that you'll probably want to start chipping away at now and do it over time. Uh, you, If you're like most people, you won't be able to afford to sw- swap out everything all at once. Uh, so it's something to be aware of that there are things you can do around the house to reduce emissions. And in Canada and well, I mean, the northern climates, we are among the worst because we have winter and uh, heating. Home heating is a huge source of emissions. Uh, so one of the things you can do is uh, the first thing I would suggest is starting with an energy audit. Uh, I know Mitchell in the chat has mentioned that he can share his energy audit, um, what it looks like. It's it's a cool guide thing. It has, you know, all the numbers you would need for your specific house. They come and they measure things and they they do all the math and they figure out exactly what all of the uh, things in your house are, like how efficient they are and how much emissions they're making. And then they suggest changes and they give you the number of, like they give you in gigajoules how much you will save uh, for what changes, like changing out your windows and changing out your furnace and whatnot. Uh, so for furnaces, um, that's the big one in Canada. Uh, most furnaces are either oil or natural gas. And uh, as you can expect, those burn fuels and they're fossil fuels and they're not renewable. So you can change them out for a cold climate air source heat pump, which is ex- actually what I'm doing. I'm just waiting for the chip shortage to figure out my Mitsubishi. Uh, so hopefully that'll be delivered in May or March sometime. They said January, but that has passed. Um, so hopefully it'll be soon. Uh, basically it's what's in the image there in the summer. It works as your air conditioner and in the winter, it works as your heater. Uh, they're good down to minus 25 and below now. So this is not the technology of the nineties that you might be familiar with where they stop working at minus time, minus five or 10. Uh, these are cold climates, heat pumps. Um, they are state of the art. Um, they are way more efficient and the best part is they're electric, so they don't burn gas. Now in Canada, we do get minus, you know, 30 and whatnot, as we all are aware uh, in recent weeks. So they do have electric backup sources inside the air handler, um, which would be your furnace today, you know, the big thing inside the house. Uh, so the, the Mitsubishi system has a three stage 15 kilowatt, uh, electric backup. Uh, but most of the time it'll be running off the the heat pump outside um, where hot air comes in or outside air goes in cold air goes out and the hot air goes into the house um the other thing you can do if you have a gas dryer um switch it out for electric or even better ventless electric which is what i have now i just got one and it is fantastic it's basically magic you put your clothes in you put in the soap you push play it literally has a play pause button you push play and three and a half hours later, your clothes are dry and clean, and it chimes at you that you know come get your warm laundry out of the out of the washer dryer. It's the same unit; it's one box, and it's really cool. And there's no vent, so you don't have to cut holes in your wall. Um, so, what so that's brand really is that? Cool uh, mine is an LG. Yeah. It's really cool, and it uses a 110 outlet, so you don't even need a dryer plug for it. So we put ours in the kitchen. So there was a comment in there about, uh, I think it's Alan. Alan, yeah, he said that he put a ground source heat pump yep. in his house in twenty in 2007. Uh, I know Art also has a ground source heat pump. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, ground source heat pumps are more They're expensive. They're the way to go if you can. Right? Yeah, so ground source heat pumps are fantastic. However, they are expensive. And if you live inside the city of Ottawa, uh, can somebody mute themselves, please? There's a lot of feedback. Ruth? Can you? Uh, okay, she's muted. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So if you if you have the ability to put in a ground source heat pump, uh, then absolutely go that option. That's the best way to do it. Air source are great, but ground source has the heat of the earth. You're powered by nuclear reactions in the core. Um, the the nuclear heat of our core is uh, heating your house. So um, the only issue with ground source is that if you live inside the city of Ottawa, they will not let you drill deep enough for such a thing to work. Um, so you do need a bit of land if you do it horizontally and if you drill vertically, then you need to be in a space where you're allowed to do that. Um, and they are very expensive to put in compared to slight correction, uh, Mike, both art, both art and, uh, Alan live in Ottawa. Do they? So like where in Ottawa though, like not. Yeah, I'm in Canada. Oh, Canada. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And our, our drilling plan was originally two boreholes of 300 feet. Okay. But uh, the revised, we hit a an aquifer at 160 feet, so they revised the the drilling to 
be four boreholes of 150 feet. Interesting. For the aquifer. Yeah, I mean, like I'm in Alta Vista, and I looked into it, and we're not allowed to drill. Like, there's just yeah. it's not. We're not allowed. So I, maybe it's inside the green belt. You're not allowed to drill. But anyway, it's well. If there's if, limits if, here, right? right? Yeah. If there are impediments so like that, we uh, we probably need to lobby people like uh, Mitchell maybe <laughs> yeah. to, to help us uh, get uh, get away from that. Art is yeah, in I'm, uh, I, Manotech. I've got, uh, I'm in Manotech, mm -hmm. and uh, I've got a horizontal heat exchanger in the ground, yes. which I put in like a slinky. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, anyway, it's um, uh, it's kind of a unique installation, and and when I give tours, I, I give a a full explanation as as to how it works. But I see uh, it's got a minimum coefficient of performance of uh, at four point two. Oh wow! And and uh, in the shoulder seasons, I'm seeing as high as sixty. Oh wow, so, that's that's amazing. How much? How big is it though? Like, what's the acreage that you needed to do that? Um, well, it's it's uh, it's not really that big in terms of acreage. Um, <clears throat> I I mean that's a good question, and and maybe one day I should just go out and, and measure it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but uh, I've only gone down uh, eight feet. That's right. And, yeah, and yeah. put this coil in, and. Um, back filled with sand and mm -hmm. let the thing fill up with water. So, yeah. and it's really the water, which I'm after. Anyway. You're circulating. Yeah. I mean, so the horizontal ones are great. If you have the room, most urban lots are too small uh, to have enough space to dig um, a horizontal ground source heat pump. So in, in urban lots, the vertical one would be the only practical option, just given the size of how much space we have. Um, but if you're out rurally and you can get a hold of a backhoe, uh, then yeah, absolutely, it's probably the way to go. It's the easiest, right? Well, well and you can just, DIY just, it too. Just a point here. A point here. You got to differentiate between a new build and a retrofit. I was True. a retrofit, mm -hmm. but I mean, I look at these housing developments going up, and they, and they dig down for the foundations, and what an ideal time to to just yeah. run some PVC pipe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And 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 you can do community, um, uh, you community know, ground heating, sort of yeah, heating, district, yeah. district and heating. This yeah. happens. This happens in in places in the U.S. By the way. Yep, and and Scandinavia too. They have a lot of district heating uh, in like Norway and Sweden and what not. Yeah, Craig. Craig, you had a comment? Question? I, I was just wondering with the fact of the um, sort of really cold. Is there any possibility of having, you know, I know we don't like the idea of any dinosaur burning, but having sort of the ability to switch off to when it's really, really yes. cold? Yeah, so the so the, the Mitsubishi system I, I'm getting, which is the one that's pictured, actually, it's from the manual I got, um, you can have a fossil backup. However, there are some limitations when you go that route. Um, so the... With a fossil backup, it means that the outside heat pump has to turn off. So it shuts down completely because the fossil backup is running and there's some issues there with um, being able, like, you know, safety issues and whatnot. Um, when, whereas when you have an electric backup, they can work in tandem. And so the way that Mitsubishi does it is they'll run the, the, the heat pump outside. And then if it's not quite meeting demand, they'll kick in one of the first stages of the electric and they'll run together in tandem and then slowly ramp up from there if it needs to, right? So it's a lot more efficient. Whereas if you do a gas or oil backup, um, so basically you would just keep your furnace and then the heat pump would run as as a separate thing. Uh, then what happens is the when the fossil backup kicks on, the outside one has to turn off by regulation. Like they're, they're not allowed to run in tandem, uh, which is a yeah. bit of a drawback because that means that you're missing out on uh, a lot of savings there because th these heat pumps can run down to minus 25. Now the, the the efficiency starts dropping off severely after minus 25, but there's still some heat being generated there uh, that you would just basically be throwing away. I guess more more my question would be what is if we still have the 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 furnace if you if if you've got a newer furnace uh, that you know doesn't have to be re replaced now could you not have both your sort of existing uh, a fossil furnace and a new heat pump and only bring in the fossil furnace 
when it's sort of minus 20, you know, or uh, lower or something like that, that you sort of start bringing in there. Is that a possibility? Is that yeah, like, yeah, that is yeah. like do the eco bees of the world are they able to sort of can you program the eco bees to have to sort of like do that kind of thing? Yes. Look at the outside temperature and do that. Yeah, that's what they do. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's just you're missing out on the heat pump part. Um, as soon as that furnace kicks in, the heat pump turns off. Right, Even so you're missing out on systems. They're separate systems, but they work together. So there's a bit of a harmony that has to happen. And okay. so as soon as the fossil kicks in, the outside one turns off um, if it's fossil based. If it's electric based, it can continue running. I think um, we're talking about forced air systems here. But yes, you, that's right. If you were to use like um, uh, floor heating, uh, like a, a for for first for one of the one of the systems, I mean, you could easily do something like that too, right? Yep. And have, mm -hmm. have the traditional forced air furnace for your backup, but do uh, uh, in-floor heating with uh, a ground source heat pump or a, or other system. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I, I'm only talking about forced air. Yeah. Um, I should have made that caveat earlier. Sorry about that. It's just most people in you know Ottawa have forced air for their houses, as far as I know. So, um, yeah, John, John, you've got a, your hand raised. Yeah, with the Mitsubishi, Mike, uh, does the air circulation come as part of the Mitsubishi or are you using your existing furnace as your air circulator? No, it comes with, uh, so it's called the Zuba system and there's an indoor air handler that they replace your furnace with and then there's the outside unit and they work together. And so the indoor air handler is basically just a, a filter, a blower, and then a three-stage electric element. Um, and then there's the heat exchanger, obviously, for the, the the heat pump itself inside that unit. But it's a very compact, small unit um, that looks roughly like a conventional, you know, gas furnace or what have you. Um, but they're they're part of the system. Now you can get you can keep an existing furnace if it's reasonably new, and just add the Zuba outside. Um, but then, like I said earlier, then they work together. But then they have to like one has to turn off and the other one comes on and. It, it's not quite as streamlined or elegant and less efficient when you do it that way. Uh, so if there's no more questions, I'm going to carry on. And Terry has a question. <laughs> yeah, just a comment. Um, I have a heat pump, uh, a mini split. Uh, I've got two heads in the house and uh, ha uh, hot water heat. And uh, it just uh, is triggered to shut off at minus 15, which is its limit. So at mm -hmm. minus 15, you get nothing at not, uh, and then at, uh, or minus 16, you get nothing. At minus 15, it comes right on and produces um, all the heat that you would expect. So it's an on off switch in, in mine and it's, a, it's mm -hmm. a brand new system. Nice, yeah, I'm, different manufacturers have different um, technologies and capabilities, right? So it's a, it's a Mitsubishi. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's just different ways of doing it. Um, yeah, the Mitsubishi I'm getting, um, and I see somebody in the chat says they got the same one two weeks ago. So, um, but yeah, the Zuba I'm getting, it's it's good down, it's 100% down to minus 20, and then minus 25, it's still producing 80% of the heat, and then it starts going down from there. It's like a, you know, curve. Yeah, um, so I, I want to highlight what Mitchell was uh, we just wrote there. He said his parents' uh, system handled the minus 30 degree weather without using resistive heating. There That's you go. Amazing. That's amazing. That's what I'm hoping too. <laughs> So Thanks, Mitchell. That's it's, great. Yeah, it's about fifteen thousand is what uh, what uh, that uh, that cost. So I, I think I'm one of the only ones without a heat pump here. So I'm, I better get off uh, my butt and get that yeah, done. So. Get, get it ordered because it takes like <laughs> seven months. Yeah, yeah. It's a big big thing is about insulation. Of course, we had to really boost the insulation in our home to put in the ground source heat pump. Yeah, so and that's where the energy big, audit comes in, right? Half so energy needs, right? That's right. So the energy audit will tell you to do a lot of stuff um, that isn't the sexy stuff that stops burning things. Because um, the idea is to get your envelope as tight as possible and as, as warm as possible before you switch out to electric, right? Um, and so, like, we redid the windows, we re-insulated the attic. Uh, we've done a lot of work to our 1960s house uh, to get it to the point where we can now switch out the furnace. Um, but yeah, definitely do the insulation first, insulate your basement. There's a lot of easy, low-hanging fruit um, that will save you money immediately as far as even if you're burning gas. Um, now, the point of this talk is to stop burning gas uh, entirely. But so these are the, the technologies that I'm talking about. There's a lot of other stuff like talking about home improvement is, you know, probably a whole meeting in itself. Uh, I'm just trying to highlight the, the technologies you can do. 
um, that are available so that your house can go fully electric and you can get rid of fossils. And my goal is to cut the the Enbridge line to my house uh, sooner rather than later. Um, so if there's no more questions, I'm going to carry on. Um, so the gas dryer was one, so we've just replaced ours with an all-in-one. I'll get to some questions I see in the chat after. Um, the gas water heater. So we have a gas water heater right now, and we're going to be swapping that out for either an electric or a hybrid. I haven't decided quite yet. I'm still running the numbers on that. Um, but either way, obviously, there's electric water heaters available. There's tankless water heaters that are electric. So lots of options there if you have a gas heater. And then, of course, a gas range. Uh, we originally got the gas range because we like to cook, and gas was the best for a while, according to marketing. Um, but it turns out induction is better. And so we're switching out our stove for an uh, range. Can somebody mute whoever's making noise there? Marcel?
And this concludes our monthly meeting for the month of January 2022. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Consider giving us a like and a subscribe, and we'll see you next month.